Hello and welcome to part 6 of the Zenith walkthrough. We're on the map Secret of Halaka, and this map is sort of similar to 6.1 because there are two different paths that the player can take to finish the level. However, in this case, they lead to the same ending point within the map as opposed to uh, ending at different points and beginning at different points of the next map. So there are a few interesting features in this map that I'd like to point out. And the first thing to note is the immersiveness of the environment. And I'd like to take this in the context of atmosphere. That, for example, the rain, the fog, the lighting, and the swampy feel to the surroundings uh, this sort of makes for an interesting and, and overall convincing atmosphere. And here you can see as well the Misha the Sled Dog style skybox that decorated uh, Dasa Mountain Pass in the first Unreal. But the texturing through the entire map is very Unreal-esque. It's not anything new, but the combinations of exterior visuals are a lot more convincing than most outside world maps that sort of wanted to portray a swampy, rainy environment were in Unreal. Uh, well, at least in Real Engine 1. And in this case, it is the case here that like some other swampy Unreal uh, environments, the terrain fails to be convincing. It's usually flat and sparse in areas, and still the detail of those areas is not as great as it should have been. And that is the case with the majority of the outside world in, in uh, Secret of Halaka, that you begin in a rugged environment which uh, appears to be somewhat uh, above average in terms of uh, attention to detail and in, ter in terms of ruggedness of, of the terrain and everything like that. But as you progress through the map, it becomes uh, m more linear and uh, definitely sparse. So the presentation of the temple entrances could have also probably been better planned as well. This is a rare occasion in Zenith where the conceptual grandness is not really exhibited in the presentation of the location, nor in the exterior, but rather the inside. And with respect to the atmosphere, the map does well to be convincing it at the least, uh, particularly of its personality. And the music, in my sense, doesn't particularly accentuate it. It's not really part of what makes the uh, atmosphere uh, come into existence as, as convincing. So as we mentioned in both paths, the presentation of the interior is immersive and conceptually grand. My evidence for the first is the exhibition of the eagle busts, which hang over high uh, inside a towering hallway surrounded by warm lighting with dark contrast, which is also contrasted by light in, on the, along the walls that is sort of a cold lighting that has a cold feel to it. They're cold colors contrasted with warm colors, all immersed in darkness. And the symmetry combined with the dissonance and detail that begins in depth at the top and becomes simpler at the bottom is a very interesting and impacting visual presentation that is rather unique uh, and along with the music, it provides uh, maybe a more articulate expression of visual personality. In the same way that the entrances to the Col Colosseum uh, are impacting in the sense that you have a, a, a giant Colosseum that is spread between uh, warm and cold color uh, in the background and then uh, you're entrenched in a pit where you are not only able to visualize this, uh, but the way the combat is set up, it sort of forces you to realize where you're at. That comes off as a sort of interesting and unique approach to, to presentation that, that isn't really seen in, in, in uh, unreal environments in the first place, in terms of sheer geometry and, and the way it's presented.
And one thing that's interesting is that the Colosseum is sort of impacting uh, simply by the lighting combined with the sheer size of the room and the contrasting colors surrounding that pit, uh, which are lit in a symmetrical manner, make for an eye-catching environment. And the rest of the map from there on out is detailed with either cozy or methodically lit rooms, or exotic large hallways with lighting that takes advantage of their geometry. So that leads to the extent to which uh, visual impact provides enough flavor for the player to appreciate uh, as they fight their way throughout the map. And in most cases, while the geometry of the interiors do not flow, as it were, and are largely characterized by large hallways with small, unique rooms, the attention to detail in terms of visuals of each room is enough to keep the player interested in them. The one thing that uh, takes away the most attention from the visuals is the combat. And the combat is much more intense in the Colosseum path because it's easier to pass through aside from the enemies. The mini boss fight in the Co Colosseum, for example, was enough to keep the player alert and excited. And the other events in that path, such as the scar crawling around the inner hallway, or uh, the part where you're locked in a room that have to, you have to uh, battle the giant flies or mosquitoes, uh, and anything that basically takes the player on edge presents itself as a challenging opportunity. And the other path did not disappoint in the sense that the gameplay was more focused on puzzles, but the map does well in terms of combat events and, and monster placement to keep the player far from boredom. The only problem with this is that the puzzle path is uh, on some occasion rather vague and in, in that the player couldn't really figure out in, a, in just a couple minutes what exactly they had to do and that could lead to boredom for a lot of players. The boat rides also make for an interesting play as the player is allowed to uh, take a minute to rest before engaging in the climax of the combat which is the first battle against Vector's uh, marine uh, combatants. And there there is no subplot particularly in this map, but the map acts as a bridge between the current setting and the final levels as it provides an explanation for Silka's rescue and the, basically the final fight between the protagonist and the final boss. And that's sort of uh, been the villain behind the scenes for half of the campaign. The one thing that sticks out poorly is that Zenith doesn't have a focus on a straightforward antagonist or greater objective, and due to the fact that it was cut off at the end uh, with a to-be-continued uh, explanation, the potential for a greater realization of the main idea was never provided. In some regard, Zenith was never really intended to be a professionally flowing storyline. For a greater part of its creation and its existence, it was a result of indulgence in design and experimentation with architecture and environmental art. And in some cases, it was the result of meddling with approaches to gameplay. So a significant portion of the campaign was just a result of those pursuits. And those were the more important pursuits. So here we can perhaps reflect on what John Carmack uh, from id Software said about storylines in video games although perhaps not to the absolute extent he took, but essentially that the plot in video games is a lot like the plot in a porn movie. It's there, but it's not really important. If the projection of Zenith were to be one of those uh, cases whose entire attention was toward the critics or a specific audience of gamers, its setting would have lived entirely within the confounds of where the story begins, which is in a giant futuristic city, and it would have been much more flowing and a lot shorter. But that, however, was never the case to begin with.
So overall, the map itself was designed well, and its interiors are, are rather memorable uh, due to those uh, impacting and conceptually grand moments throughout the map, and the visuals mix between unique and conventional. The only problems were that uh, it sort of needed more immediate presentation that was more impacting, referring to the outside uh, part of, of the map, and it needed better flux on the part of the insides. And one thing I've mentioned here is the conventional setting of the map, and you might have noticed that there are quite a variety of environments and settings when it comes to the scene of the campaign. It sort of jumps from one to the other, and in some regard that is beneficial in and of itself because players will be accustomed to expecting something new every time. However, in some regard it makes the storyline sloppy in that it has to jump from one part to another. And it sort of gives occasion to a case where the storyline is not as cohesive as it should have been. But for the same reasons that we said before, it was really never the intention to make a cohesive storyline to begin with.
So now we come to the boss fight, and for the case of normal mode, there's really not that much to the boss fight as it's almost the same as fighting a regular titan, except that the titan has a lot more health in this case. But if you have plenty of ammo, you could still kill him without going through the entire boss fight. But for heroic mode, there are a few more things to make note of. First off, the boss will throw molten rocks, which in some cases will explode and spawn fire spiders. And that pretty much happens indefinitely. They will pretty much spawn almost infinitely if you do not kill the boss uh, within so, uh, good timing. In heroic mode also, the boss has a ton more health, so what you have to do is lead him towards the passageway, uh, the gateway to the other side of, uh, of the slope, sloping um, pit. And when you do that, when you get inside, trigger the falling pillar so that it hits the boss uh, when he goes through the gate. And you have to do this twice because he has so much health. Uh, the, the impact from the pillar only does about 50% damage, so you'll have to do it uh, twice and then finish him off with, you should have but like a thousand health at the end after two impacts. So it's actually pretty simple overall, but the tricky part is leading him there and dodging the rocks while doing so, because remember that these titan rocks, these projectiles can be pretty jumpy and bounce around and, and hit you and end up, end up killing you in the first place. Sometimes you might have to take a few melee hits so that he stays still uh, when he's inside the uh, gateway so that the uh, mover can actually impact him because sometimes he just walks through it and hopefully you only have to take a few hits and you'll have plenty of health to do so. So keep in mind that you have to conserve some health for the sake of the boss fight as you're going through mission 7. Get nothing, but now I have to rescue Silka.